You guys smell good. You know that? Yeah, it is good. In a room this small with this many people, if you didn't smell good, it'd be a problem. Let's uh, just move on, shall we? <laughs> Um, we are continuing um, with our test five. Oh, I got you. <laughs> you were hoping I'd forget. <laughs> I've asked uh, Rich Romick if he would come up and share with us uh, a little bit about his testimony. So I'm going to turn this over to him. I'll move my stuff out of the way. That way you have the whole pulpit to yourself. There you go. When we started out, I bet you were going to forget about it. Yeah, oh. I have to worry another week. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I really wasn't sure how I was going to start out my testimony this morning, so I guess I'll just start at the beginning. Uh, when, I, uh, when I was young, my parents were divorced. I was about four years old. I, I was raised in a church uh, that never, you know, I was raised in a church from from when I was small, my mother made sure that we went to Sunday school every week, you know, we never missed a Sunday, and, and uh, but, you know, all those years through, uh, through going to Sunday school, going to church, I never once heard about how the Lord Jesus could save me from my personal sin. It was, it was, a, it was a UCC church, United Church of Christ, that I was raised in, and they, they just didn't preach salvation like we hear today. We were... We were, we were saved by our works, by how good we were, how, you know, if we went through confirmation, we went through confirmation, we, through all the rituals, we had our communion, we were, we were then, you know, good enough, I guess, you know, and I'd never, never heard a message of salvation, I was even, after I was confirmed, I would sit up in the balcony in the church and I would hear the 15 minute sermon that, that the pastor would give every Sunday morning and I would wonder, well, how do you get to heaven? You know, and I, at a young age, I was, I, I wondered that. How, how is it that you, you uh, that you can uh, get to heaven? Is the preacher going to be the only one gone, or are we gone? How do we get there? I never, I never heard that. And uh, so, you know, we went on, uh, uh, met my my wife, and uh, we went together for uh, 1965. We were married, and. Uh, we, we had our family, and uh, we had our first child, uh, Tori, and, was, uh, and then Angie come along at, uh, in 1970. Well, in 19, uh, th this is probably the worst weekend of my, of my whole life, of our whole life, our family. Uh, we uh, were planning, uh, it, was, it was our daughter's fourth birthday, and we, we're going to celebrate it, and so we celebrated, and we were planning on leaving for Denver the next morning. Well, as everybody knows you, I kind of like to fish, and I just I was working at the and Company, and I just started my week's vacation, and I thought, and we weren't planning on leaving until Saturday morning, but, uh, you know, my, my selfish, you know, my, me and Sandy were talking, said, you know, if I would, if we would leave tonight, on Friday night, I could uh, I could leave I could be home on Monday and I could have a whole week to fish, you know. And uh, so uh, after the celebration was over, we had our bags packed because we were leaving the next morning. So we threw everything in the car. It was about six o'clock in the evening, and uh, we took off for Denver. Well, you guys might think this is kind of strange, but you know. That, at that time, boy, I was a real world traveler, let me tell you, me and my wife. I mean, if I drove around the block, I'd get lost, you know. <laughs> and anyway, Sandy and I, we packed up the kids, and we went to, uh, we were heading for dinner, and it was dark. And uh, we, <laughs> we got to Cheyenne. I mean, we were young, we didn't know, you know, I, I mean, like I said, I was a real world traveler. I don't think I made it out of Scott's Bluff a half a dozen times in my whole life. And when I did, I was with someone else. <laughs> and then we did, we did make it to Denver on our honeymoon, but I got lost then too, so. <laughs> but anyway, we got to Cheyenne, and uh, we took a wrong turn. 
and we got one of these four leaf clovers you know, to go around. <laughs> and and uh, we went around and we couldn't find the turnoff to go to Denver. And so I told Sandy, I said, uh, I'll stop in here at this gas station and I'll ask and see where the turnoff is. So we, we uh, I went in and I asked and he said, yeah, just go out here on the road and go down the roadway there and you'll, you'll see the turnoff to Denver. I said, okay. So we, we go out there and I'll be going. I got on that 40 clover again and I went around the second time. <laughs> <laughs> I went right by that same chilling station. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I'm going to ask again, so I go in there and I, that's the guy said, where'd you say that term was? And he looked at me like, really? <laughs> <laughs> and he says, uh, then he even pointed, he said, just go out here on the road, he says, go down there about a mile, he said, and you'll, you'll see it. And I go, okay, so I go back out in the car and uh, start driving and I went around again and said, this road looks familiar. <laughs> Did ain't that the same gas station we stopped at a little bit ago? <laughs> yeah, I told my wife, he says, uh, you know, you want to go in and ask? He <laughs> <laughs> said, no, I'm not going in, I'm holding in. I said, fine, okay. So I, you know, I said, I'm not going back in there. <laughs> so I said, you know what? I'm just going to follow this truck. He looks like he knows where he's going. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, isn't that the way it goes, you know? When we're unbelievers, we go around in the same circle several times looking for a different result. You know, and that's kind of the way I was. And so, you know, so I follow that trucker all the way to Laramie, Wyoming. <laughs> 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 he obviously knew where he was going, but I did. <laughs> Guess what? I stopped another gas station. <laughs> and I went in there and said, I think I took a wrong turn at Cheyenne. I said, we ended up in Laramie. He looked at me kind of funny like, like really? <laughs> so anyway, we got on. He said, go up here, take 270, you gotta go to Port Collins and then take a right and you'll head to Denver. Well, you know, it took us about an hour and a half to get to Laramie. And then it took us about another hour, hour and a half to get to Fort Collins before we could get to Denver. And uh, we, so, uh, you know, and I was always worried about the traffic. Well, when we got to Denver, we didn't have to worry about the traffic because everybody was in bed. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, we spent the weekend with Sandy's cousin. We <clears throat> had a good time. Went to, <clears throat> went to uh, Cospany there, this big nice Mexican restaurant that had just opened. We went there. It was, it was great. We had a great time with them that weekend on the way home. Uh, you know, we bought some tapes. You know, you remember the same the tapes that we had as Creedence Clearwater and, and the Mamas and the Papas. <laughs> I mean, that's how long ago it's been. And so anyway, we, uh, uh, we we went, had a good weekend. Never did get to fish that next week. The Lord had different plans. So we came home, we, on Sunday morning, we were getting ready to come home, and uh, I stopped in the gas station, got a, got a pop out of the machine, and uh, <clears throat> anyway, we started, we was at the gas station, and I, I told my wife, our, our four-year-old daughter, Tori, was sitting in the back seat of her Mustang, and I said, you know, you better put her seatbelt on. I said, you know, we're getting an accident. I said, I want her to have a seatbelt on. And I said, I'm going to put mine on. And uh, Sandy said, you know, I'm not putting mine on. If we get in an accident, Angie was only a month old, I want to be able to cushion her fall. So what happened? And not thinking too much about it, we got about halfway home, and Tori laid over in her seatbelt and was sleeping. I told Sandy, I said, you know, you better reach back there and take her seatbelt off. I said, if we get in an accident, I said, that could break her back or whatever, you know. And so, she reached back and unhooked her seat now. Tori was just laying on the seat. She had Angie in her arms a month old. And <clears throat> we got down. <clears throat> we got down to well and then I had to, I had to just to show you how 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 God worked, I mean, I I had to stop and I had to use the restroom 
Well, I stopped at that at the Silver Tip Cafe, which is a little cafe, a little restaurant. Well, it was closed, and I mean the timing. And uh, we got down to <coughs> uh, close to Yoder, Wyoming, and uh, I, I seen this truck coming over the hill. It's a big farm truck, and I went. I know he did. When I did look back, I, I know he didn't see me because I went right behind him in Bankman, right when he was coming down that hill, so he probably didn't see me. But anyway, I was going about 65, 70 miles an hour. And uh, right when we got, the truck was coming down, and I thought, first of all, he's not going to stop. Well, I got down to the, got down there right by the stop, and looked like he was going to stop, and he didn't stop. And he come through, and he hit us right in the right in the back wheel where our four-year-old daughter was laying. If, if she'd had a seatbelt on, I wouldn't even want to know what would happen at that time. But anyway, he hit us. We rolled two times, and I, I looked over the second time, and Angie didn't say anything right there. And I don't know why, but it's just like it was yesterday. And I rolled twice, the door was open, they weren't there. And the car landed on its wheels, thankfully. I was in my seat belt, bruised. And I got out of the car, our four year old daughter was in the back seat on the floor. She ended up with a broken collarbone. I was bruised. And I went out to look for Sandy and Angie. And they're sitting. Sorry. <laughs> she had Angie, her month old baby in her arms, which he cushioned the fall. And <clears throat> You know, after something like that, you would think, you know, that you would just jump right to the nearest altar and accept Jesus as your personal Savior. But that didn't happen. It still took me three years after that, before, you know, I'd, I'd come to know Jesus. But after that accident, why? We got a, got a different car, got a, a new car again, and we we were doing all right. We were just, you know, before that, doing like most married couples, you know, we were just getting along and we were paying our bill. But after that accident, it seemed like something happened, and, and the Lord was gently leading leading us along, you know, in our, in our life, and he, and he started blessing us with things, you know, to, and I mean. Here we were, you know, like 24, 25, and the Lord, I mean, it, we just were able to start getting these things, and I, and I even told Sandy, I said, something's wrong, I've never, nothing like this has ever happened to, to us before, because I was, I was really basically with nothing, I, and then I still was able to get, you know, we were in our house, we were able to get, pick up the camper, we had a boat. I mean, we were had a good job, swimming company, you know, and, and I mean, but something didn't seem right. You know, we even, uh, a couple of years later, we were able to even move into a brand new Spanish decor home, beautiful home, and, but something just didn't seem right. And I, and I <clears throat> even told Sandy, I said, what, why is, What's going on? Why is God blessing us with all this stuff? But this was God's way of bringing us along, Jim, and, and not harshly, but you know, and it it was, it was really strange. But anyway, I was working at Swift and Company, and, and there was two gentlemen there that were Christian. That you know, every time I don't know what drew me, drew me to them, but they were they were believers, and they kept telling me what what I had to do to be saved. And, and, and then after, 
And uh, I mean, we were taking our kids to Sunday school every morning. You know, every Sunday morning, just like we were, we would drop them off, and once in a while, uh, we would go to church, you know, with them. And, and uh, we still had the same type of background that I grew up in. It was a UCC church. And, and, but then that, that pastor retired, and we got a, a great uh, uh, Christian man in there that preached the word. Christian Martin was his name. And he, uh, uh, we were in church one morning, and it just sounded like he was talking to me, you know, about, you know, just personal things, you know, what, about me. And I thought, I don't even know this guy. How does he know that about me? You know, and I mean, that was probably just, he started to get to me, you know, and he was, and we just got to the point where I got to the point where I just knew there was something missing. I felt like I was in a corner. That God had me in a corner. And and me and Sandy, we were even talking, and I said, you know, it just seemed like we don't have a choice in this matter of accepting the Lord. And so uh, uh, one, uh, we always had an evening service, but one night. Our sister church there had a, he was a, he was a good pastor too. I mean, he preached the word. There's a lot of saved people in that church. There's a lot of saved people. People got saved in our church as well. And so we started fellowshipping back and forth together with congregational churches did that back then. And uh, it was uh, October 21st, 1973. And they had a Billy Graham film at their church. And after the witnessing and, and everything that these two gentlemen were and, and going to church and hearing this pastor that we had, and I went forward and I accepted Jesus as my personal savior. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been a great thing. You know, we're not perfect, we're just, you know, we're forgiven. And it's, it's amazing what, you know, he still continues to bless us. <laughs> You know, today, and I, I'm so thankful for that. And that he didn't have to, he didn't have to take me down the hard road, you know, to get there. But he took me through the gym road to, to get to know him. And I, I'm so thankful for that. Anyway. <laughs> So we are in Colossians, chapter 3. We're rolling along. Uh, I just want you to know, uh, when we were in Houston, my uh, oldest brother, who is, is one of my accountability partners, he's uh, pastored a church for a number of years, and, and uh, he said, I'd have never believed it possible to preach that many messages in that short of book. <laughs> God has a lot to say. So, we're still working through this. You know, and I, boy, I tell you what. Um, last week, we spent all of our time on humility. This week, we're going we're gonna to try and cover, we'll see, we're going to try and cover meekness and patience. So you guys are practicing patience as we get through Colossians. I'm helping you. So let's uh, start reading. Verse 12. Paul says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. 
bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Now, keeping in mind, Paul is in the midst of, of doing a contrast here. Okay? He's already laid out what our lives were like before God had sealed us with his spirit. You can go back into chapter 2 and read the first part of chapter 3. And you'll see kind of what, what, he's, what he's doing, what he's laying out before us. But now he's talking about the attributes, the characteristics, the description of those who are sealed by God's spirit. Now, some may have less, some may have more. But the point is, everybody should have. Okay? Um, uh, please don't tell my neighbor this. But he gave us some fruit. And he was very proud of this fruit that he had grown. I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's a grape or a blueberry. And I can't taste the difference. But it's good. Whatever it is. But see, the, at the same time, Christy had bought grapes and brought them home. And, and these grapes, they're, they're like mutant grapes. I mean, they're like this. They're like two-bite grapes. And his are just these little, little tiny, and they're good. But they're just little tiny things. I, I can't quite tell what it is. And I'm not putting a lot of them in my mouth until I know what it is. <laughs> Got a taste. It was good. I don't know what it was, but it was good. My point is, do you have fruit? Okay? You may have a little tiny fruit. Or you may have the mutant fruit. Our goal is to be growing mutant fruit, right? Right? Well, this is the fruit that we're talking about here. And as we talked about the previous weeks, we've talked about put on then as God's chosen one. We are chosen of God. We are separated from this world. We are separated unto Him, holy, no longer profane. We are beloved. Oh, how He loves us. I mean, we don't grasp the full measure of His love. And yet, He loves us. And then, here's what we look like. Compassionate hearts. Kindness. Humility. Meekness and patience. And if you look at these attributes, these are attributes that are not highly prized in our culture. They're not really, how much, um, I'm a hockey fan. One of my favorite hockey players of all time was Joe Sackett. Okay. He had a nickname. He was called Quoteless Joe. Because he didn't get a lot of quotes. He didn't have a lot to say about things. He didn't get a lot of air time. I mean, this was a man who at one point was in the top ten scorers of the NHL. Okay. This is a man who had done something. But when they talked to him, he didn't ever talk about Oh, look at me. Look what I've done. Oh, yeah, I'm going to go get more. He just, he was, he just was presented a very humble front. As a result, he didn't get a lot of airtime. Now, when you're watching football, when you're watching baseball, when you're watching basketball, you know, quite honestly, in hockey, they all say the same thing. Well, we're just going to get out there, work hard, and try and put the buck in the back of the net. I could do that. <laughs> I mean, I could say that. I couldn't actually do that. Right, Scott? Right. <laughs> but the guys that get in front of the camera are the ones that think highly of themselves. Are they showing compassion hearts? Oh, we're going out next week. We're going to rip them up. We're going to put them in their place. You don't come into my house. Okay. Kindness. Humility? Humiliation sometimes. Not humility. 
Meekness and patience. We're, we're up to meekness and patience today. And I want to talk to you about meekness. Because we have a problem. We have a problem. You know, the word meekness is used frequently throughout the New Testament. But did you know that in current translations, they almost never put the word meekness in there? They use another word. Which is it's okay, because it can be used either way. But they opt for the lesser, less better translation. And they put in gentleness. <laughs> and they do that with a reason. Because in Western culture, meekness is not an attribute to aspire to. So let's take a look. What is meekness? Well, you know, I, I like Webster. I don't like what they've done to his writings over the last you know, couple of decades because Webster was a believer and a lot of the description that he gave in his dictionary and his definitions of words were based on scriptural principles. And they've kind of taken those out. So Webster says, having or showing a quiet and gentle nature not wanting to fight or argue with other people. Enduring injury with patience and without resentment. Mild. Deficient in spirit and courage. Submissive. Not violent or strong. Moderate. Now in our culture, can you see these definitions fitting to the manly man? Somebody does us an injury, what do we do? We go get ours. Submissive? Really? No. Hey, this is a land of independence. We stand on our own feet here. You know? We don't have nobility in this country. Everybody's equal. You can't tell me you're better than me. Not violent or strong. Who wants a weak man? <clears throat> oh, I gotta move a bunch of timber and rocks. Who's the weakest one here? Come help me. We don't want that. We don't want the wishy-washy man that uh, can't make a stand and, and say what he believes and just kind of. Mm -hmm. We don't want that. Well, let, let's take a look at what the Greek means. Okay. The Greek is mildness of disposition, gentleness of spirit. Now there's a uh, Christian writer, uh, way back when, his name is Theophilact, and I'm going to read you a quote from him. He says, the meek are not those who are never at all angry, for such are insensible. But those who, feeling anger, control it and are angry only when they ought to be. Meekness excludes revenge, irritability, morbid sensitiveness, but not self-defense or a quiet and steady maintenance of right. Now, there are two men that I know of in Scripture that were called meek. Okay? Now, can anybody give me a, a run at the, either of the two of them, or both? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah? He says, come to me, give me your burdens, for I am meek and lowly of spirit. Who's the other one? Moses. Moses. Who was more meek than any other man at his time. And yet, let's take a look at what these meek men <coughs> did. First, do you want somebody weak carrying your stuff? You know, we're getting ready to move. You're going to move your house. Remember that prized possession you have? He's going to carry it for you. <laughs> Not far. Do you want somebody weak to carry your burdens? Are you going to entrust them to him? As he's saying, at the one and the same time, give me your heavy stuff because I'm a wimp and I can't handle it. No. No. Because we don't understand what meek is. Moses. Good heavens. 
God gets a hold of him, the whole burning bush thing, and take off your sandals and go back to Egypt. But 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 God, but God, I stutter, stutter, stutter. You know, some people think he stuttered. Some think he was just slow to speak, or some think he was just making excuses. Oh, that's okay. I got that taken care of. Moses, your brother Aaron's coming. Damn it. <laughs> I'm without excuse. Okay. So he goes. He goes. And he goes and he confronts Pharaoh. And Pharaoh goes, oh yeah? Ha! Let's see how you guys like making bricks without straw. And the people that Moses is going to help hate him. Boo! Boo! They didn't, they didn't like him. Okay, would that be considered meek? Is that weak? Because see, the two are not the same. Now let's just, let, I'm going to jump back to you. I'm going to go back and forth here. Let's, let's think about Jesus for a minute. What, what trade did Jesus have? Carpenter. He built stuff. Without Black and Decker. <laughs> With tools that he probably made. So, um, you know, they didn't have nails. So everything was fitted together with pegs. Everything was done by hand. Mike, how would you like to do all your cabinets by hand without any of your power tools? No. 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 i got to imagine Jesus had an incredible grip. I mean, strong hands. He's one of those men that was careful when shaking your hand because of his, the strength in his hand. He also walked everywhere, back and forth, back and forth, and around and about and back and forth. And then occasionally he'd get on a boat. You ever notice? Don't ever get on a boat with him. Because <laughs> you know it's going to storm. <laughs> and you're going to look stupid. You get on the boat and it rains and he's sleeping. And then it blows and he's sleeping. And the waves are coming over and he's sleeping. And you go, Jesus! And he says, what is your problem? Stop! And then you go, oh. Or, or you, he's not in the boat, and it's storming, and he comes walking out on the water to you. My, my, my philosophy, just stay off of boats. Okay? Is that weak? No. He's not a weak man. Now let's think about this as far as preparation of life. Why did Jesus come? Why did he come? From the moment of his birth, he was here for one purpose. One purpose, to die. Okay? Now, all of us that are born, depending he doesn't come back for us, we're going to die. That's kind of how it works. But, we aren't born with the purpose of dying. Not only was he born to die, but he was coming to die a horrific death. Now, we did communion this morning. His body was broken. It wasn't enough to thunk on him a bit. It wasn't enough to whip him. They're spitting on him. They're scourging him. They're ripping the beard out of his face. He was not recognizable as a man when it was done. Okay? This was the purpose for which he came. And he did it with strength. See, meekness, my own personal description of meekness is strength controlled. You can't be weak in serving God. Not in the light of what the world has to offer you. The opposition that they're going to come through against you with. Meek, yes. But if you've got God's Spirit living in you, what can they do to you? If God be for us, who can stand against us? Who? Nothing. Nothing. He has taken away the power of the enemy. we got an enemy that can't do anything against us. But what God will allow. Why does God allow that? We're going to get into that under patience. <laughs> so meekness. Let's, let's take a look at a couple things. Okay? You with me so far? Yeah. Is meekness weakness? No. 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 Okay. Um, here's, here's one of the examples that I have a problem with. Matthew chapter 11. Flip over there with me if you would. I actually, I just uh, quoted the scripture just a minute ago, alluded to it. <clears throat> okay, 
I'm going to jump all the way down to the end. Okay? But the, the premise set up here is John the Baptist has sent messengers to Jesus. John is in prison, and he wants just confirmation. Are you the one? Okay. And all this has gone on. Uh, Jesus has answered him. Um, he turns around and he speaks out against unrepentant cities. Woe to you. Woe to you. And then he comes further down and he, he says, he kind of shifts and he says something kind of interesting. He says, at that time Jesus declared, this is verse 25. I'm starting in verse 25. At that time Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise, understanding, and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Now this is what's interesting right here. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now in 29 he says, for I am gentle. That's that word. Okay, the, the Greek is propse. Okay. That's that word that the best translation we have for it is meek. Gentle is a secondary. Now, in recent times, I'm, I'm going to read you a quote out of uh, Baker's, what is it, Baker's uh, Evangelical Dictionary. Okay. Late 20th century Western culture does not hold meekness to be a virtue. I have to agree with that. I mean, think about it honestly. Do you really hold meekness to be a virtue? Okay. In contrast to the, near, to the ancient Near East and the Greco-Roman world, which placed a high premium on it, this dramatic shift in values is problematic for contemporary biblical translation. Most modern versions replace, replace the noun meekness by gentleness or humility, largely as a result of, of the pejorative overtones of weakness and effeminacy now associated with meekness. See, in order to be able to effectively reach our, our culture, because our culture resists being meek, they have to take a secondary translation, one that's not as effective as the first. Okay. To be meek. To have strength. Think about this. <laughs> Jesus is standing at his sentencing. They're getting ready to kill him. And Pilate has the audacity to say, Don't you know it's in my power to set you free or to condemn you? Well, you, you don't have any power but what came from on high. So don't you know that I could have legions of angels here at my call? I can... Really, Pilate? Really? You're going to do what to me? He went as meek as a lamb to the slaughter. That was his purpose. That was his goal. That required strength for 33 years. Strength. Looking toward the end. Scorning the shame of the cross. Strength. Strength under control. I mean, think about it. The garden. I love the fact that we see the humanity and the divinity of Christ in the garden. I love that fact. I mean, here he is, and he's praying. His humanity does not want to go through what's coming up, because he knows. God, if it is your will, Father, take this cup from me. If there's any other way, please, take this cup from me. But not as I will, but as you will. Your will be done. That's strength. That's strength. Then they show up, and Peter whips out a sword. <laughs> Off goes the ear. No, no. He picks the ear back up and... and... I mean, the last miracle before his death is putting the guy's ear back on because the guy wanted to arrest him. Talk about grace. Strength. Now, 
I told you guys a couple of weeks ago, I see a lot of these traits as mom traits, as, as wife traits. Okay? That's my fault, my flaw, because all of these traits are given of God because they are of God. They are His traits. But when I see, uh, you know, kindness, I see mom. And I, I shared with you guys how in our family, Christy's job is to affirm them. And my job is to make sure their heads don't get too big. And kindness doesn't really help a lot when you got to let the air out of their head. And so I have to work. It's not one of those natural things that comes to me. Um, more natural to me is sarcasm. You know? Um, so I have to, areas that I have to work on. Meekness. To have the strength to know you could do otherwise and to choose not to. Why? Because God just wants us to be kicked around all the time? Is that really what his point is? No, it's because when we are meek, then he can show his strength through us. He can show the world what he can do with people that will submit themselves and subject themselves in totality to his will. Do you get that? If you are not meek, it's because you are proud. Because you think you can handle it and do it on your own. We talked about this last week. What does God do to the proud? He resists them. That's an active word, not a passive word. He doesn't just turn a cold shoulder and ignore them. He resists them. And I tell you what, he's an immovable object. You can't budge him. If he resists you, you will lose. That, that's kind of the way it is. Okay? So, if you are not meek, if you choose to not be meek, it's because you think you've got something that puts you better. And I want to bring it right back. Who are we supposed to emulate? Jesus. Jesus. Who, being in his very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but instead humbled himself, became a man. But he didn't just become a man. He became a servant. And then went to the cross. Suffered death, even death on a cross. Okay? But it doesn't end there. Because see, here's the thing. When we take on the very nature of God, it's always for our benefit. Okay? Yeah, it, it's going to benefit others around us. I mean, really, when you're selfless, that's a good thing to other people, right? I mean, my wife is incredibly selfless in how she treats with me sometimes. A lot of times, most times. <coughs> Much more so than I am with her. I benefit greatly from her selflessness. But when we stand before the throne of God, and He rewards those for having done His will, and He does reward them, can you imagine how great her treasures will be? I can't even begin to fathom. So see, I, I tend to associate a lot of these with women. But really, it's, it's kind of the, the sin part of the fall of man, where the separation came in, you know, where we have this whole thing, husbands and wives, and, and instead of meshing together, they, they kind of clash. And, you know, we're doing love and respect right now. You guys can come and join and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Okay. But really, when sin came in, we, we've separated things out. This is yours and this is mine. I go out and I earn the bread, but actually I just earn the money and then you go buy the bread, but buy the, buy the kind that I like. Don't buy that one with all the nuts in it. <laughs> and then bring it back with the salami and the turkey and the roast beef and the mayonnaise. And I don't really care whether it's Miracle Whip or mayonnaise. I can't tell the difference, so whichever you like, go ahead and get that one. But you got to put it on and then scrape it right back off because I don't like a lot of mayonnaise. <laughs> and then... 
with the, you know, the slice of tomato, but it's got to be pretty thin because I don't want to really taste a lot of tomato. I just kind of like it in there because it's pretty. And then you got to put the thing of lettuce on there, but don't put the heart of the lettuce because that's crunchy. I don't want the crunchy. <laughs> and then you put it together, and, and if you would, please cut it. But don't cut it straight up and down. Don't cut it across. Don't cut it corner to corner. It's just got to be kind of off center. <laughs> and no, I, I don't want chips today, thanks. You didn't buy the kind I like anyway. <laughs> okay, we laugh, but how often do we do that? Really? You know? I thought that was you. That sounded like <laughs> I thought you were describing yourself there. First. I absolutely was. Okay. I absolutely was. It's never been said like that, but it took about 25 years to get to that one. <laughs> and I don't like bread with nuts in it. <laughs> But the, the point is, you know, when God has called man and woman together, you know, uh, Kelly and Michelle used to always say marriage is designed to kill you. <laughs> and I, I agree with that because you can't live for yourself and make a marriage work. You have to die to yourself. You have to put the needs of your spouse first. Now we're going to carry this over. In the marriage relationship, there's not going to be a lot of working together. There's not going to be a lot of good things if we exist in pride, right? If, if your mentality is, I deserve this, or I deserve better than that, there's clashing, right? But if we can be meek with one another, if we can prefer one another, ouch, there's a, there's a whole term we're going to get into, but not today. If we can prefer one another, the marriage works. Because if all of a sudden I turn around, and I get off my duff, and I make not only my sandwich with my exacting specifications, but I learn how to make her sandwich with lots of mayonnaise and nuts in the bread, and she doesn't care what way it's cut, and I make that for her and bring it to her with the chips she bought that I don't like, but she does. Do you think the marriage is going to work better? Oh, yeah. You betcha. You betcha. But now let's take it a step beyond that. What happens if we take that same play and we put it into play in church? What if, uh, you know, we come to church looking to serve? Look to, to go there to, to minister instead of just be ministered to? What if we look to come in and bless others instead of sitting there going, bless me, bless me, bless me? Because I, I, I'll, I'll tell you, kind of one of the weird things about how this whole sandwich thing works. When I make the sandwich for Christy, both of us are blessed. And she always responds. Always responds. It's always a blessing to her for me to do that. So it's not like I've really put myself out of a heck of a lot because, I, I, you know what? I don't even have to clean up the kitchen afterwards. Because she jumps on that to bless me back. See, we take that and we put that into play in the church. And we quit coming to get and we start coming to give. And we come in with an attitude of controlled strength. Yeah, I can do this, but you know what? I'm not going to. Because that's not going to be a blessing to you. That's just going to bless myself. I don't want to float my own boat. Okay? So, we have this understanding that Christ has called us to be meek. Meek has nothing to do with being weak. And if we are weak, can you imagine what we're going to lay at His feet when we stand before Him if we live a life of meekness? I mean, think about that. You stand before the throne of God. You can cast your couple sent his piece before him. There you go, God. Uh -huh. Look what I got. And somebody starts coming up with wheelbarrows and dumping it. Wheelbarrows and dumping it. You know, I, oh man, I don't want to be one that gets up there and I'm, I'm in. I want to be one that gets up there and God meets me at the door and says, good job, kid. You did good with what I gave you. For those of you that have better grammar, he'll use better grammar. 
don't worry. He's not going to talk to you like he talks to me. If we are willing to take upon ourselves the nature of Christ. Now, here's the cool thing about this. All right? Now you're all stressing. Oh, great. Now I've got to get up and be me. How do I do this? You can't. You can, you can pretend. You can put on a facade for a while. And what usually ends up happening is you've got this very thin-skinned facade of meekness out here and this anger and bitterness inside. you got to get out of the way up. Did you get that? you got to get out of God's way. If God has His Spirit living in you, if you are a Christian, that's a given. You can't be a Christian without His Spirit living in you. Do you know that? Okay? So if His Spirit is living in you, let the cork out and let Him do what He's supposed to do. Make in you a new creation. Bring fruit out. Let it bud. Let it grow. Let it be a mutant. Get out of his way. Humble yourself before God and he will do marvelous, marvelous things with your life. Marvelous things with your life. And we're going to talk about one of those next week because we're running out of time. We're out of time. You're going to have patience. Boy, I can't wait to talk about that one because I am so absolutely horrible at it. <laughs> Amen? Amen.